And let us go to the book of Revelation. Let's go to Revelation chapter 19, where we left off last time. Revelation chapter 19. And we'll start reading at verse 17. Revelation 19, verse 17. If you remember, we'd just seen the Lord Jesus returning, King of kings and Lord of lords. Let's just go back. Let's just go back to verse 16, just to remember the last verse we looked at last time. So verse 16, we saw that on his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Yeah. Jesus is now returning. The culmination of the ages. Revelation chapter 19. And then John sees the rest of chapter 19, which we'll look at, and then into chapter 20. So I'm just going to keep reading even when we go into chapter 20. So let's start at verse 17. So then John sees an angel standing in the sun who crowd, cried in a loud voice to all the birds flying in midair, come gather together for the great supper of God so that you may eat the flesh of kings, generals, and the mighty, of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, great and small. Then I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to wage war against the rider on the horse and his army. But the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet, who had performed the signs on its behalf, with these signs, he had deluded those who had received the mark of the beast and worshipped its image. The two of them were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. Let's read one more verse, then we'll pause. The rest were killed with the sword coming out of the mouth of the rider on the horse, and all the birds gorged themselves on their flesh. So this is the final battle, the battle of Hamagido, where Jesus returns, which we've already looked at, so we're not going to go over this. He returns and he wins the victory and he, he carries out all the activities we looked at last time. But just a, just a note to notice there, um, when it says the birds of the air, the birds of the air uh, uh, often a pictograph in the uh, in the Bible of demonic spirits or evil spirits. You remember when Jesus throws the good seed, it's the birds of the air that come and take away the gospel. Why do so many people not believe the gospel? Because they're listening to deceiving spirits. So the birds of the air are often this picture, the birds of the air come and living in the branches, the birds of the air eating flesh, the, the symbolic of demonic spirits or evil spirits uh, in uh, metaphorical pictographs. And so, Jesus wins the battle. Notice how the battle is won. They're killed with the sword coming out of his mouth. In other words, Jesus wins the victory by speaking the truth. Yes. It's, it's a strange concept how, that we fail to grasp how powerful truth actually is. When truth is fully revealed, remember Jesus is the, faith, he's the one who is faithful and true. We looked last time at how Jesus is truth. He wins the battle just by turning up. Remember, Jesus doesn't fight Satan. It's not a contest. Jesus just speaks the truth. The sword coming out of his mouth, which we know is the, the word of truth, the sword of the spirit, the two-edged sword, which is the word of God, the Bible tells us. Jesus wins the battle not by carrying out violence. Neither do his followers carry out violence. There is a battle and people are destroyed and, and die. You know, when God turns up in his full truth, when, when you realize that you've actually been blaspheming him, killing people and waging war against him, the truth might actually just kill you. The splendor of his coming, the, 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 the glory of his fullness of revelation, it will, it will melt you when, when we realize how true and Awesome he really is. And so the three rebellions that we've talked about over and over again, they're, they're put down now. Jesus speaks. The victory is won. Okay? So, now what? What's going to happen now? If Jesus has come, is everything suddenly all right? We all go off to heaven? No, that's not what happens. There's actually a very systematic program that God's going to carry out when he returns. Jesus isn't just coming to get rid of bad stuff. He's coming to follow a preordained, pre-programmed pattern that he's already talked about throughout the whole Bible. If we go to Revelation chapter 12 and verse 7, uh, sorry, Daniel chapter 12 and verse 7. If we go back to Daniel, remember what Daniel told us 
uh, all about what was going to happen in, in massive detail. So we know that there's a three and a half years uh, of the seven year revelation period, and then there's a final three and a half years. Actually, that's not totally correct. Here's what Daniel tells us. The man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the river lifted his hand and his left hand towards heaven and I heard him swear by him who lives forever and ever saying it will be for a time, times and half a time, three and a half years, 1,260 days. We've looked at that in detail. Saying it will be for time, time and half a time when the power of the holy people has been finally broken, all these things will be completed. When the nations finally attack Israel and the beast and the Antichrist and, the, and it seems as though they've won the victory over, the, over Israel and the, the power of the holy people has finally been broken, all this is going to be completed. Uh, the Messiah is going to return. What did Daniel say? I heard but I did not understand. Most pastors hear that every Sunday. I heard, but I did not understand. So I asked my Lord, what will the outcome of all this be? What on earth is going on here? What will be the outcome of everything you've just shown me? It's, it's almost too, too much to comprehend. So what do we read next? Let's keep going down. He replied, go your way, Daniel, because the words are rolled up and sealed until the time of the end. Many will be purified, made spotless and refined, but the wicked will continue to be wicked. None of the wicked will understand, but those who are wise will understand. You would think when all these things are being fulfilled, people would start to understand. No, people are becoming more blind, even though they're literally now being fulfilled in our lifetime. Let's, let's read down. From the time that the daily sacrifice is abolished and the abomination that causes desolation is set up, remember that's halfway through the final seven years when the beast reveals himself, the Antichrist, that's halfway through, there will be 1,290 days. Has anyone noticed something? That's not 1,260 days. There's another 30 days being added on. Yeah? That's not three and a half years. That's three and a half years plus another month. Why is that? Blessed is the one who waits and reaches for the end of the 1,335 days. Now, maths is not my strong point, but he's just added another 45 days on. Yeah? So now we've got 75 days longer than the three and a half years. But all through this study and all through... Uh, what we've been looking at, it's a seven-year period. It is a seven-year period till Jesus returns. But then there's another 75 days where Jesus is going to do things when he returns. And so Daniel is being told here, especially in relation to Israel, the holy people, and throughout Daniel and throughout the whole of the uh, prophets and in Revelation, we have to realize what's going to happen during that 75-day period. Because Jesus comes at the end of that seven-year period, of the 1,260 days. But then there's going to be 75 days of activity. Now, we'll look in a minute at why it's 75 days. Some of you might already know. As for you, Daniel, go your way till the end. You will rest... And at the end of the days, you will rise to receive your allotted inheritance. So Jesus comes, returns at the end of the 1,260 days. He returns at the end of the seven years, or the three and a half years after Antichrist has set himself up in the temple. Let's go to Revelation chapter 20 and verse 1. Revelation chapter 20 and verse 1. And let's just read down what is going to happen now when Jesus returns. Now, we've already looked at some things that he has to do. Remember, when he returns, he has a program of activity that he carries out in Israel, and he goes to Armageddon, and he goes to Jerusalem, and Bosra, and different places. So, here's what John sees. I saw an angel coming down out of heaven, having the key to the abyss. Now, we're into chapter 20, but the narrative's not changed. We're just following on. Remember the chapter divisions are man's invention, not God's. Having the key to the abyss and holding in his hand a great chain, he sees the dragon. Who's the dragon? It tells us. The ancient snake, who is the devil, or Satan. Okay, so we're not confused. Don't just think it's a metaphor of him being a dragon. He's a real living entity who once was a snake like Kerabim. He's a devil or Satan, the accuser, and bound him for a thousand years. Okay, so 
Satan has to be bound. Right, let's read down. He threw him into the abyss. Can you remember what we looked at previously about what the abyss was? When they opened the abyss, the fallen angels came out. Yeah? And that's what caused the demonic activity to spike during this period. It's not just humans getting bad, it's humans becoming demonic in this final period. Locked and sealed it over him. Notice it's not Jesus grabs Satan. It's an angel. Jesus doesn't have to fight. He's already won the victory. To keep him from deceiving the nations anymore. Remember, all the deception of the nations comes from the original source of Satan lying to people and then believing it. And he's still doing the same today. People still are seeking their own pleasure in life rather than the, the joy that comes from serving God. Keep him from deceiving the nations anymore until the thousand years were ended. What thousand years? Well, he's going to tell us. After that, he must be set free for a short time. Why? I don't want him to be set free for a short time. Why can't we lock him up and throw away the key? Why have we got to let him out again after a thousand years? What on earth is going on here? Why does this have to happen? This is some of the things we're going to try and look at tonight. I saw thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge. Okay, who are they? And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony about Jesus and because of the word of God. Remember, the beheading is what happens during the final days where the nations controlled by Antichrist behead people who will not submit to their religion because of the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. What, a thousand years again? I thought Christ was coming to reign forever. Or is he just coming to reign for a thousand years? Let's carry on reading. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. Okay. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy are those who share in the first resurrection. The second death has now no power over them, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him a thousand years. So once again, we're told this period is going to be a thousand years long and these people who belong to Jesus, they're going to be priests. When a thousand years are over, Satan will be released from his prison. Okay? So, well, I think we'll stop there. Let's try and get a handle now on what's going to happen when Jesus returns. Okay? There's going to be this thousand years. But between his return and the thousand years that we tend to call millennium, that comes from the mille meaning a thousand and annum meaning year, mille annum, millennium. Before this happens, there's going to be this 75-day process where Jesus is going to do things. Okay? So, you could call this the 75 days of preparing for the kingdom to be set up. Can we put up the first uh, chart, please? Jesus has to do certain things. Now, we've just looked at a lot of them there. Okay. The first thing Jesus has to do. Okay. He has to throw the beast into the lake of fire. Now, historically, I used to think Jesus turns up, grabs him, and throws him straight in the fire. Good riddance. Remember, the beast isn't Satan. The beast is the Antichrist. And so, what Jesus does is, he has to go through this process of cleansing the earth of the things that have contaminated the earth, getting rid of evil. Now, I think Jesus might even have a trial. He might show people, judicially, what this beast has done and reveal to everybody what he's done rather than just grab him and throw him in. So I think that might be one of the reasons why there's this 75-day delay because I find that God always does everything through a proper due process. He always does things by showing people, explaining to people, and I'm sure that when Jesus returns, there's going to be this process that he has to go through. So he's got to do all these things. So he gets rid of the beast, the Antichrist, the world system that is in rebellion against God. Remember, the beast is also a governmental national system. So he's got to get rid of the government. Praise the Lord. 
He's got to get rid of the corrupt government. You've got to get rid of the corrupt government before you can have the new government, yeah? And in most, in most nations, that takes a while. It takes a while to replace the government with uh, another government. So he's got to do that. The second thing he has to do, and these are sh we've already read these in Revelation chapter 19, he has to get rid of the false prophet. The false prophet has to be thrown into the lake of fire. So the pro false prophet, remember, is the religious system. He has to cleanse the earth of false religion. He could just say, forget it, but I think he's doing something here in showing people, look, I'm getting rid of false religion, I'm getting rid of the lies of false religion, and so he puts the false prophet into the fire as well. Notice they're the only two people in the fire, and there's no one else there. Third thing he has to do, which we've already just read, he has to bind Satan. So straight away there, you've got what we've seen throughout Revelation, the satanic trinity that is a counterfeit of God. Jesus has to replace it with the true trinity. He has to reveal to the world Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, not Satan, beast, and prophet, which that's a counterfeit of the holy trinity. So Jesus has to deal with these issues. Right, why doesn't he throw Satan into the lake of fire? He throws the other two into the lake of fire, but Satan, he ties up. Because he hasn't finished with Satan yet. Because God is doing something to reveal to mankind what the essence and nature of evil is. I don't know if you've noticed, but mankind doesn't listen to God when he tells them stuff. It's a bit like mankind's a, like a teenager. You can... You can God can tell mankind something, but mankind doesn't listen. Or they pretend to listen until they're out of the way, and then they, they, they still don't listen anymore. God, after a thousand years, is going to bring Satan back to see how mankind reacts. And do you know what mankind does? Follow Satan again. That's how dumb mankind is. We sometimes think that our Christian lives or our options or our volition is, is based on what we think. It isn't. It's based on whether you follow truth or whether you follow lies. It's based on whether you believe in the one true God or whether you follow Satan. And God's going to prove that through a thousand year process. This is how he's going to do it. And so God here is showing this counterfeit trinity of how he's going to remove it and deal with it now all these three people are still alive all these three concepts are still alive satan's bound so when jesus returns a mighty angel comes and binds satan yeah can christians bind satan Can anyone give me a scripture where Christians can bind Satan? He's the prince of the power of the air. He runs the kingdoms of this world. Be very careful when you just assume the things that Jesus can do in every realm, we can do in every realm. Now, don't get me wrong, we do have authority, and we can bind and loose things. But when you bind Satan, where do you put him? Can he come back? When he's bound here, so if you can bind Satan, then you can't bind him and put him in the abyss, because only Jesus can do that. I think we just need to be a little bit meticulous with what our authority is in this world and be very careful of claiming you have power over things when actually you might not have now i do believe by the power of the holy spirit we have power over everything if we're in full submission to the holy spirit but but the answer is being in full submission to the holy spirit it's not in just saying the words binding and loosing things is a spiritual truth Jesus was revealing to us. It's not just something you say. It's not an incantation like abracadabra. It's not magic words. It's living in real truth. 
So Satan is bound and cast not into the lake of fire, but cast into the abyss, the bottomless pit. Okay, next thing Jesus has to do, he has to resurrect the martyrs, those who have been killed in the seven-year period. So, I mean, does he just snap his fingers and everything comes back to life? Possibly, but they might need explaining what's going on. They've just been resurrected. So he's going to have to give them rewards because some of those are going to be kings and priests in the new millennial kingdom. So can you see all this is going to take a few hours, would you agree? Maybe a few days. So he's got this process that he has to go through. So the martyrs are going to be resurrected. We've already read that in Revelation chapter 20 and verse 4. Let's look at the next one. Okay, he's got to deal with Israel. Remember, Israel has been in unbelief, and then it comes into belief, and Jesus explains, and he gives a very good explanation of what he's going to do here in Ezekiel chapter 20. Can we go there? Let's go to Ezekiel chapter 20 and verse 33. As surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, I will reign over you with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm and outpoured wrath. So he's talking about the return, not the first coming, because that's not what he does. I will bring you from the nations and gather you from the countries where you have been scattered with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm and with outpoured wrath. Let's just read down a little bit. I'll not read it all. I will bring you into the wilderness of the nations and there face to face I will execute judgment upon you. As I judge your ancestors in the wilderness of the land of Egypt, so I will judge you, declares the sovereign Lord. Let's just read a couple more. So this is when Jesus returns and he's going to deal with Israel. I will take note of you as, a, as you pass under my rod and I will bring you into the bond of covenant. I will purge you of those who revolt, revolt and rebel against me, although I will bring them out of the land where they are living, yet they will not enter the land of Israel. Then you will know that I am the Lord. God has to sort out Israel. When Jesus returns, he has to make the difference between those who have disobeyed and the elect and the remnant, the 144,000 who were with him. So Jesus has got to sort out the true Israel from the false Israel, and he has to give rewards, etc. You remember when Jesus says when he returns from being appointed king, those who have been faithful, he said, take charge of five cities. You remember the parable? So Jesus is going to sort out a lot of these issues especially in Israel, because Israel's inheritance has to be divided up. The Jews will now receive their inheritance, 12,000 from every tribe. So he's got to allocate that. Now, Joshua took a, a while to sort that out, so I'm sure Jesus is going to fill up these 25 days sorting this out. Let's go back to the chart then. Let's look at number six. The next thing. Jesus has to sort out the nations. By the end of the seven-year period, the nations are in quite a mess. I'm sure you'll all agree that. There's a lot of things been going on. And we've read that in Daniel chapter 12, where it says, blessed are they who make it to the end of this period. That's not just the seven years. That's the end of the testing period where Jesus is going to sort out the nations and Jesus said in uh, Matthew chapter 25 exactly what he's going to do when he returns so if we go there it tells us exactly what he's doing during this period so let's go to Matthew 25 and verse 31 so when the son of man comes in his glory not his first coming Jesus is already on earth when he's talking about this. He's talking about when he returns. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, so it's the return, he will sit on his glorious throne on earth. Not the one in heaven, he's already on that one. This is the one he's going to sit on on earth. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another, as a, shepherd, as, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. So Jesus has to bring all this judgment of the nations. Everyone's going to be judged. Jesus, if you, if you remember this parable, he's going to point out the difference between those who are blessed and those who are cursed. Yeah? Remember what we've just read in Daniel chapter 12. Blessed is he who gets to the end of this period. What does Jesus say to these people in, in this period? Blessed are they who are true servants of his. Blessed are they who 
served others and in, do, in doing so served him. They enter into their inheritance. What does he say to those who are cursed in Matthew chapter 25? Depart from me, ye cursed, into the lake of fire prepared for the devil and his angels. The lake of fire was not created for mankind. It was created for evil. But at the end of this seven-year period, the nations of the world, remember the, the, the righteous have been removed, the nations of the world have chosen to follow the devil and his angels. So they have chosen to follow them into the lake of fire. They made that choice willingly and volitionally. God has no option but to honor their choice. So they had to depart into the lake of fire prepared for the devil and his angels, okay? And the last thing, obviously, on that chart is that then Jesus has to inaugurate the kingdom. So Jesus has to set up what we tend to call the millennial kingdom. Uh, but that's our imagery. Basically, Jesus sets up the kingdom and he's going to rule the kingdom for 1,000 years. So he's going, to, he's going to set up this millennial kingdom that we read there in Revelation chapter 20 and verse 6. So why was Daniel told there's going to be a 30-day period after Jesus returns and then there's going to be a 45-day period after Jesus returns. In other words, why is there going to be 75 days after Jesus returns? Well, we've already seen he's got to do all this stuff, but there's also a very other biblical reason why that period is so. If we go to 2 Chronicles uh, chapter 30, 2 Chronicles 30 and verse 2, in the Bible, good King Hezekiah, when he brought the people back to God to celebrate the Passover. Does anyone know what, what month Passover is in? I don't mean our month, I mean Jewish month. I don't mean the name, I mean the number. Let me read it to you. The king and his officials and the whole assembly in Jerusalem decided to celebrate the Passover in the second month. Yes, it was sort of a trick question. You're supposed to do that in the first month, according to all the Levitical laws. The Passover, you've got to do right at the beginning. Right? Jesus died on Passover, the beginning of our salvation. Right? When, when were the Jews saved? Passover, the first, the first day. They were saved, the Passover lamb, and then they went into the Exodus. Yeah? So Passover is supposed to be the beginning of the first month. Here, there's a 30-day delay. They had not been able to celebrate it at the regular time because not enough priests had consecrated themselves and the people had not assembled in Jerusalem. So the Bible shows us that because the people weren't ready, in fact, just go to the next verse, verse 4. Now, this, the Bible says this was the greatest celebration of Passover they'd ever been. The plan seemed right to both the king and the whole assembly. So God allowed this. God allowed a 30-day delay so all the priests could consecrate themselves and get ready to celebrate something even though they should have been ready 30 days before. You would think a priest would have known because a priest's job was to get ready for Passover. You know, so you would think that the fact that he didn't get ready for the day that he was supposed to be ready, you know, 30 days is a bit much. But God allows a 30-day delay. So when Daniel says there's another 30 days, I think this is exactly what's happening. There's already a biblical precedent. It's for consecration, gathering people at Jerusalem and getting everybody cleansed, ready for what God wants to do. Now, if Hezekiah had to do that because the people weren't ready, I'm sure Jesus is going to allow it to get people get ready. Remember, these are people who belong to God already, but they're still not ready, if you know what I mean. You can be ready and then you can be ready. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, are you married? Yeah, yeah, being ready doesn't mean you're ready. Yeah, I'll leave it there. So you've, you've got this 30-day delay for consecration, gathering people together and being ready to celebrate the thing God wants to celebrate. Yeah, so what about the 45 days? Why is there 75 days in total? Well, I think the, um, 
as well as looking at the things that need to be done that we've seen, you've got the 30 days consecration, people getting ready, getting cleansed, ready for what Jesus now wants to do. But you've got a 75-day period from when Jesus returns, from the final feast. Remember we looked at the seven feasts. Can you remember what the seven feasts were and what they all represented? You've got Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits. Jesus fulfilled all those. He is the first fruits. He is the Passover lamb. He is the bread of life. Yeah? You've got Pentecost. Yeah? Harvest, where the Holy Spirit came. But then you've got the three unfulfilled feasts. Trumpet. When we hear the trumpet, we know it's time to go. But then you've got tabernacles and atonement that run into each other. So when Jesus comes, he makes atonement. So the final fulfillment is Jesus coming and finally saving Israel, making atonement for Israel. Now, he's already done it by his blood, but they don't, they don't believe it. And then the tabernacle in the Sukkot, the dwelling of God with man. That's why Jesus is coming, to dwell with man. However, although they, they are the seven Moedim, the seven feasts of the Torah, did you know they had another feast later. It was called Hanukkah. It's not in the Old Testament, but it is in the New Testament. Jesus went to that feast. We, in your Bible, it will be called the Feast of Dedication. Do you know what the Feast of Dedication was? The Feast of Dedication was set up because the first Antichrist, Antiochus Epiphanes, set himself up as God in the temple and desecrated it. And so it had to be cleansed. Hanukkah, the feast of dedication, rededicating the altar and rededicating the temple. Guess how many days after Yom Kippur dedication is? 75. So, God, the, so there has to be a 75-day delay for all the priests to be cleansed, for everyone to be gathered, and for the temple to be rededicated and the altar to be rededicated. Because there is going to be a temple built, not just before Jesus comes. There's going to be a new temple in the reign of Christ on earth. Now, it's all, I, I believe it's, it's going to be uh, largely symbolic, and I believe it's going to be interdimensional. I think it's going to actually be an access, uh, like a stargate, if you want to use those phrases, between heaven and earth. Uh, we could go into that in great depth, but I'm not going to. It sounds like science fiction, but I think biblically we can see this sort of thing is going to happen. And so there's going to be this 75-day process of preparing everything, dealing with all the things we've looked at. Jesus is going to do all of these things, and he's going to cleanse Israel, regather Israel, sort things out, give the inheritance, deal with evil, put some in the lake of fire, bind some, sort out the nations, resurrect people, deal with the martyrs, cleanse, prepare, consecrate, and get everything ready for the kingdom. So, when we get to Revelation chapter 20, we are, we are shown a picture of what the kingdom of God is. So, can we put up that next chart, please, Beata? Let's go to the next chart and let's look at the kingdom. When Jesus comes to set up the kingdom, what's he actually going to do? What is the kingdom? What is the millennial reign? What's God going to do? Do you ever think about having a good government? I know it's a massive stretch of the imagination, but imagine like everything working right, everything working correctly. Imagine, how, how is this going to be set up? What's actually going to happen? Because Jesus is going to come and rule the world. So what's he going to do? Because remember, there's still lots of people on the planet. And so Jesus is going to set up the kingdom. And I've just put some things here that, you, that I've called global aspects of the kingdom that the Bible has already prophesied to us back in the Old Testament of what's going to happen when this happens. Let's look at the first thing. There's going to be a right government. There's going to be a correct government running the planet. And I'll give you two quotes there from Isaiah. We know the first one very well. 
because we sing it every Christmas. Isaiah chapter 9, we don't need to turn to it. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders. And in the increase of his reign and government, there will be no end. He's going to set up a government, right? He's going to delegate authority. He's going to sit on a throne in Jerusalem, but don't think everybody on the planet can just walk up to him and, and demand an audience. No, he's going to appoint people in positions of power and authority, as he's already told us, to run the planet. He says a similar thing in Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 4. Let's just look at that one, Beata. People might not be as familiar with that one. Isaiah 11 and verse 4. But with righteousness he will judge the needy, and justice he will give decisions for the poor on earth. Now you might think, oh, that's when he came the first time. No, it's not. Read the context. With justice he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. With the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. Well, he didn't do that, did he? When he came the first time. Does he do that the second time? Yes, we've just read it. Out of his mouth comes that sharp two-edged sword, so he destroys wickedness uh, with, with this, this power and authority that comes out of his mouth. Righteousness will be his belt and faithfulness the sash around his waist. We've already just read in Revelation chapter 19 that he's the righteous one. He's the one who is faithful and true. So he's going to run government on a righteous order and a godly system. Yeah? Second thing he's going to do then, let's go back to the chart. There's going to be massive geo geographic changes on the planet. Now we've already seen this with a lot of the earthquakes and things described, but the earth is physically going to change. Now the Bible's very, very clear about this. Not just what we've read in Revelation, but you'll, you'll read there, in, I'll give you two examples, but there's more in the Bible. In Ezekiel 47, we don't need to turn there, it talks about the Dead Sea becoming fresh. So there has to be a massive plate shift. Now that's at the bottom of the, the Jordan Valley, the Rift Valley plate, which could move at any time, by the way. So there's going to be this huge shift and fresh water is going to flow into the Dead Sea. There's going to be topographical changes. But one of the changes that the Bible talks about an awful lot is in Isaiah 2, verse 2. Let's go to that one. And this is talking about huge geographical shifts. Uh, some of the main plates in the, in, on the globe moving so that mountain ranges move as well. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills and all nations will stream to it. Now, this is talked about a lot in the Bible and it's not a, merely a metaphor. It literally talks about the mountain Jerusalem being lifted up high so that the mountain ranges move and Jerusalem will become the highest of the mountains in that area. Now, if you've been to Jerusalem and you're in Jerusalem, you realize you're at a very elevated position anyway, high above sea level, looking right down into the Jordan Valley, which is below sea level. So that's a massive range in itself. But this is going to change. And there's going to be geographic changes. Jesus is going to alter the physical components of the planet. And he created it in the first place, so he can do what he wants with it. But that's something that's going to happen. Let's go to the next one then. Next thing that's going to happen. These are not necessarily in any order. He's going to establish world peace. Yeah? We sort of knew this one. Um, many people thought he came and did it at the first time he came, which he did in that spiritual reality, he created the judicial uh, ability for world peace, but have you noticed the world's still not at peace? Have you noticed that? Hopefully, if you're alive, you've noticed that the world is not at peace at all. In fact, there's more wars going on now than there's ever been. Okay, but we are told very clearly that when he comes, he's going to establish this peace. Now, I've put there Micah chapter 4, verse 3. Can we go to that one? This is actually repeated. This is one of those occasions in the Bible where one prophet copies another prophet. Micah and, Jer and uh, Isaiah were contemporary. Now, you may have, uh, you may have heard this um, mentioned many times. He will judge between... 
my yeah. peoples and will settle disputes for strong nations far and wide. Remember, he's bringing a judicial process throughout the nations. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. You may have heard that. It's quoted in Isaiah, uh, the same statements. But it's actually um, the, um, these scriptures, Isaiah and Micah, are actually on a huge plaque outside the United Nations. Did you know that? that nations will not take up sword against nation anymore, nor will they train for war anymore, because the United Nations thinks they're bringing in the kingdom. Now, they might not describe it like that, but that's what secular humanity thinks it is doing. Secular humanity, secular godless humanism, genuinely believes it will fulfill the requirements of the kingdom whilst rejecting God. That is the most absurd logic anyone could ever use. But that is what most governments of the world actually believe. We can create world peace. We don't need God. World peace will only arrive when Jesus does. World peace will only be established when Jesus establishes the kingdom. It cannot be established by man. Man's deceived by Satan. Man doesn't even know how to have peace in his own house. Never mind with the nations of the world. So he's going to genuinely bring world peace. A cessation of hostilities. There will be no more warfare. Just go to Daniel 2 and verse 44. Daniel 2 and verse 44 which is the other quote that I've put up there. Daniel 2 and 44, in the time of those kings, so in the time of the, the final world empire, the beast empire, just so we know when this is, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. So Jesus is bringing in the kingdom at that time, at the end, and he's going to remove the other kingdoms. So he's bringing in that world peace. So you can't miss which kingdom's which. You can't, you can't get a false picture of what the kingdom is according to the Bible. You can if you listen to the world and, sadly, to a lot of Christians. Let's go back to the chart then. What else is Jesus going to do when he returns? He's going to bring in an unprecedented age of health and well-being. Now, let's just stop here. This is not heaven. Do we all understand that? This is Christ's kingdom on earth. It's not heaven. Sometimes we think when we die, we're going to go to heaven. You are for a little bit. But then we're coming back to earth. Then, after a thousand years, there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. But before all that happens, God is going to prove who he is. And he's got, Jesus, is going, Jesus is going to prove who he is. And the only way to prove that judicially is to establish it in a literal and real way on earth, and he's going to do that for a thousand years. This is what the kingdom is. This is Christ's millennial kingdom. And so during this time, if Jesus is running the national health or the medical systems, do you think they'll be run a little bit better than they are now? During this age... Life expectancy is going to go through the roof. Look at this one. Look at the Isaiah one. Uh, Isaiah 65, verse 20. Isaiah 65 and verse 20. You see, if we all lived as God wanted us to live, you'd live a lot longer. Did you know that? Even in just a natural sense. Some of you are not nodding. Well, you must want to die young then. God wants us all to have... His eternal life. But in the millennium, now, here he's, the prophets are talking about it again. Never again will there be in it an infant who lives but a few days. This is talking about the final stage before the new heavens and the new earth. Or an old man who does not live out his years. The one who dies at a hundred will be thought a mere child. The one who fails to reach a hundred will be considered 
accursed. So during this millennial reign, the people on earth, now I'm not talking here, the Bible's not talking here about Christ's bride. Christ's bride has a resurrected body. We're talking here about the inhabitants of the earth. People are still going to be alive. They're still going to be having families. We're talking here about the, the natural order that's continuing on earth now under Christ's rule during this millennial kingdom. Are you following this? Now, during this phase, longevity is going to be highly increased. We'll see why uh, in a few moments. It, God's going to bring in a perfect system of health and well-being. Zechariah 8 uh, verse 4 says a similar thing, but we don't need to turn to that, I don't think. But if we read now to the next one, they will build houses and dwelling them. They will plant vineyards and eat their fruit. Let's read one more verse. No longer will they build houses and others live in them or plant and others eat. For as the days of a tree, so will the days of my people, my chosen ones, will long enjoy the work of their hands. They will no longer labor in vain. Not only is it going to be an age of health and well-being, but if we go back to the chart, it is going to be an age of huge prosperity. You're not going to be, you're not going to work and then not enjoy the fruit of your labor. There's nothing more demoralizing when you work hard at something and then someone takes it off you. You think of something like communism. That's one of the reasons why communism cannot work. Because the, the harder you work, the more someone else benefits and the less you get. I think Margaret Thatcher once said, the problem with co communism is you soon run out, run out of other people's money. <laughs> People soon have no motivation to do anything because you're not reaping the benefits of the effort you're putting in. And so we've read that in Isaiah. Amos 9 says a similar thing. Let's go there. Amos 9 and verse 13. But remember, these prophets are talking about this final kingdom. They're not talking about anything that's happened in between. Certainly not at Christ's first coming. They're talking about what's going to happen when Jesus returns, when he inaugurates the kingdom age. The days are coming, declares the Lord. Now, we've already looked at Amos previously, declaring about this final stage of God's kingdom, the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven, declares the Lord, when the reaper will be overtaken by the plowman and the planter by the one treading grapes, new wine will drip from the mountains and flow from all the hills. I will bring my people Israel back from exile. So it's about the restoration and the future stage of Israel and the kingdom. Now there's metaphors and the similes being used here, but don't, don't entertain the thought that that cancels out literality. It doesn't. God is even doing parts of this now. You go to Israel, you can see it happening. I, I've been going for 20 years. I've seen places that were once a desert that are now like gardens. But it's going to increase in this millennial kingdom. The prosperity of God's people and earth as a whole is going to increase. Okay, next one on the chart. There's going to be harmony even in the zoology of earth in the animal kingdom. Now, there's several references to this. I don't think we need to know them. We all know them. The wolf will lie down and the lion with the lamb and all the... In fact, let's just go to it because I misquoted that even then. Isaiah 11, verse 6. Let's go there. Isaiah 11 and verse 6. So Isaiah here is talking about when the Messiah comes to reign on earth, the wolf will live with the lamb, the leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf and the lion and the yearling together, and a little child will lead them, the cow will feed with the bear, their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like an ox. One more verse. The infant will play near the cobra's den and the young child will put its hand into the viper's nest. What's Isaiah describing here? And other prophets describe uh, similar activities. We tend to think of nature as it exists now as if that's the way God wanted it. That isn't the way God wanted it. God didn't want violence even in nature. God didn't want animals tearing each other apart. God's plan was for peace and harmony. Yeah, codependency and uh, dependent through the biological systems, but not eating each other. 
That was never part of God's plan. God's plan was for harmony throughout the earth. And when Jesus returns, not only is he going to get rid of the violence between humans, he's going to deal with the violence that animals can participate in. That's something that, you know, a secular evolutionist would like find abhorrent. They must like the violence. There's nothing nice about a lion ripping apart a little lamb. You know, oh, that's just nature. Well, it's not the nature God intended. Not at all. God wants harmony with animals. Now, we don't have that, do we? Last time I went to the zoo, they kept the lions and the zebras separate. Now, you could have an education program to try and teach the lions not to eat the zebras, but I'm not sure it would work. But when Jesus comes, he's going to bring harmony throughout the whole earth. You do know in the Garden of Eden, we didn't eat animals. You do know that. Harmony in the Garden of Eden. Now, how does that make you feel? If you like bacon. <laughs> do you want to go to heaven if there's no bacon? Well, I think there will be trees that bacon grows on them. <laughs> now, don't, my, don't ask me to prove that theologically because I can't, and it might be totally wrong. It might just be wishful thinking, but I, don't, I think in the Garden of Eden there were all kinds of fruit and flavors and different things. So we remember uh, man was not allowed to eat animals until after the flood, actually. So you've got nearly 2,000 years of human history where God never said humans could eat animals. So there's going to be harmony even in the animal kingdom. Okay, final one then of what Jesus is going to do when he returns. He's going to renew the environment. He's going to get rid of pollution. It saddens me when Christ, some Christians don't love the environment. You know, God created the world to be a beautiful place. He created everything, you know, if we consider something waste, then it, God created it to biodegrade. You know, so you can throw banana skins on the floor in, in the field and it'll just degrade. You can throw orange peel on the floor, it'll just degrade. You're not polluting anything. Actually, you're enriching the soil. But today, we don't do that, do we? I mean, we throw stuff away that takes 10 million years to degrade. And they bring in laws now that even, even you know, you take your animal for a walk, you have to clean it up. Instead of letting it in the field to degrade, you put it in a plastic bag and hang it in a tree so it stays there for 10,000 years. <laughs> you know, you go on these lovely nature walks now and there's these little black bags hanging all in the bushes. You know what's in them, but you're not going to open it to have a look, are you? So you seal it airtight. You know, in, in a thousand years' time, you know, archaeologists are going to be digging up all this dog poo. <laughs> Thinking, what were they doing? Were they saving it for something? You know, all man does is pollute the environment. Jesus is going to enrich the environment, renew it. And, and there's prophetic imagery used there. We've already looked at one. The, the Dead Sea is not going to be dead. There's going to be fish in it. The, the environment's going to be renewed. Uh, Isaiah talk, Let's go to the Isaiah one. Isaiah 51 verse 3. Now, I've just given you two of the prophets, but all the prophets talk about this in many different ways. Isaiah chapter 51 verse 3. The Lord will surely comfort Zion and will look with compassion on her ruins. He will make her deserts like Eden, her wastelands like the garden of the Lord. Yeah, He's going to restore things back to like it was in Eden. Joy and gladness will be found in her, thanksgiving and the sound of singing. So he's restoring there the wastelands back to like the garden of Eden. You know, a lot of deserts in the world are actually man-made. It comes from overproduction or uh, misuse of agricultural systems or you know, contamination of land. That's what mankind does. Jesus is not going to do that in the millennial age. Okay? He's going to bring these global aspects of the kingdom. Okay, let's go to the next chart then. Let's go to the next chart. So, we've already read that this is going to be, the kingdom Jesus brings in is going to be for a thousand years. Yeah? Over and over again, it's stated there. They're going to be a literal thousand-year reign. His kingdom is going to be a thousand years. Why? 
why a thousand years? Well, the Bible's pretty clear about why a thousand years. I suppose if we've been paying attention as we've looked at Revelation, it has to be a thousand years. Um, because God said that's the pattern he's following. You remember 2 Peter 3 verse 8? Let's just go there. 2 Peter 3 and verse 8. God has said that a day with the Lord is as a thousand years. Yeah? Don't forget. And Peter's actually talking about the second coming here. He's talking about when Jesus returns. And he's saying, remember, a day is a thousand years. So that's the time scale that God is working towards. And a thousand years is like a day. So... If God's going to follow his same character and nature, when, when God created man in the first place, he had a day of rest. Yeah? So there was the six days of creation, and then there was the day of rest. So if this is following it on a thousand-year pattern, how many years has there been since Adam as of today as in, I'm summing that up to a generation, not literally today. How many years has there been? 6,000 years, if you add it up, since Adam. So, we're ready for all this to happen on God's time scale. Now, I'm not saying I know the day or the hour or even the year, because I don't. I'm not even saying I could date it to the nearest decade. You can't. But it has roughly been about 6,000 years, give or take a generation or so. So, that's why I believe we're in the last generation. So, let's just go to the chart. So, if God's following that pattern, it has to be a thousand years. Because all the previous dispensations have been a thousand years. Yeah, go to the next one. So, if he's keeping the Sabbath, which we know he is, because we've looked at that throughout this whole study of Revelation, he's basically had thousand year periods. Yeah? Basically, from, from Eden to the end of Adam's life is about a thousand years. It's not quite a thousand years. Look at that in a minute. And so, from Adam's, from then Adam's fall to the, to the end, that, that's a thousand years. Then you've got another thousand years to the end of Noah's flood. So you've got 2,000 years, and then you've got the patriarchs, and then you've got the Israelite kingdom, and then you've got the 2,000 years since Jesus. So can you see, we've gone through a system of about 6,000 years. So if the seventh millennium is God's millennium, because the Shabbat, the seventh, is always God's, then the kingdom's going to be a thousand years following God's pattern. There's an even better reason why it's going to be a thousand years. Because it says so. <laughs> Did you notice it said it several times as we read, yeah, for a thousand years, for a thousand years. Right? So, because God says it's going to be a thousand years, it's going to be a thousand years. That's not a metaphor, because he doesn't say it's a metaphor or a sign. The numbers, it's, it's literal just as it is in Revelation. So, that part of it is very serious. Okay? So, it's going to be the uh, one day is a thousand years. It's going to fulfill the patterns of the Sabbath. Now, look at the next one. When God created Adam and Adam sinned, he said, the day you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will surely die. Did Adam die on the day that he ate from the tree? Depends whose day you're counting. God didn't say it was man's measurement of day. God may have meant it was his measurement of a day. And with, with the Lord, a day is a thousand years. So God said, the day you eat of that tree, using perfectly proper theological exposition, you can say, God says, the day you eat of that tree, within a thousand years, you're going to be dead. Remembering that wasn't God's original plan. God's plan is, as we heard this morning, he set eternity in the heart of man. So how old was Adam when he died? Does anybody know? He was 930. So he died just short of his millennium. And he had a son called Seth. Does anyone know how old Seth was when he died? He was 912. 
And when you go through the pattern of Adam's lineage, Enosh was 905. Kenan was 910. Jared was 962. Can you see? They're all just not quite making it to 1,000. And then you had Methuselah, who is the oldest person in the Bible, and he lived to 969, but didn't make it to 1,000. In the millennium, it's going to be a thousand. Jesus is going to prove that his original word was true. And that's why what we've just read there in the prophets, someone who dies at a hundred is going to be considered a mere youth. There's something gone wrong if, if that happened. So God is fulfilling his words to the letter. By the way, the, la the last one to be one of was called Lamech. Do you know how old Lamech was? He was 777. Do you think there might be a clue there that God is showing us, in, not just in the pattern, because Lamech's the seventh. And he lived to be 777. What's the beast system? 666. That's just a hint. Don't build anything theologically on that. But I think God's showing us, look, you need to understand what these numbers mean. And this is why the millennium is going to be a thousand years. This is why the kingdom of Jesus has to be a thousand years so he can fulfill the promises, so he can prove who he is. Look at the next one. So he can prove that he can bring the life, the health, and the blessing. He can fulfill the life that Adam lost. He's going to prove it by bringing all this prosperity and blessing and peace on earth for a thousand years. Because you know what it's like in this world when people accuse. They'll say, oh, you can do that, but you couldn't keep it up. Anybody can shine for a few minutes. Well, Jesus is going to shine for a thousand years. So it's going to prove beyond any doubt that he is the last Adam, the one who can bring all the promises to be fulfilled. Next one, why it has to be a thousand years. Again, pretty obvious. Um, because he's going to fulfill all the prophecies. God's word is true. The prophecies cannot fail. So Jesus is going to bring in the kingdom for a thousand years because he's going to fulfill all the prophecies. That we, some of them we've read, but all the prophecies in the Bible. Next thing of why it's going to be a thousand years, because God is going to prove that he wins. You see, if you think about it, God's original plan was for all these promises to occur on earth. Satan spoiled all that. You see, I used to think when Jesus returns, he's just going to destroy everything and set up a new heavens and we're all going to live in heaven. But then Satan won, didn't he? Because he destroyed the earth. He destroyed God's original creation and God couldn't fulfill it. But Jesus is not just going to create a new heavens and a new earth. He is going to do that. But first of all, he's going to prove that he won on earth, not just in heaven. Remember what we pray, thy will be done, thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. So Jesus has to come and bring in this kingdom to prove that Satan lost, to prove that Satan was a liar, to prove that what God has said is going to come to pass. Satan didn't win. At all. Right? He didn't even destroy the earth. He didn't even destroy mankind. You see, Satan, I often think that Satan's a bit like Hitler. He's suicidal. It's, it's almost as if, if he can just destroy everybody else, then he's happy to destroy himself. You know, he's psychotic. He's the essence of evil. But no, he can't destroy the earth. And he can't destroy humanity. And Jesus is going to prove that he can't by establishing all these promises of blessing and prosperity and health and all these things on earth. And he's going to do it for a thousand years to prove that Satan's plan didn't work. And I think he's going to do that on purpose. So where the first Adam and his bride failed, the last Adam and his bride are going to succeed. Remember, Jesus comes with his church, his bride, and rules the earth but this time it works. It doesn't fail in the way that Adam and his bride failed. And Adam and Eve were told to rule, to have dominion, and the 
basically establish a kingdom over the earth. Well, Jesus is going to do that. He's going to establish the kingdom over the earth. Amen? Amen. Let's go to the next chart then. And let's just look at, we've looked at this before. Can we put up all of this in one go? And I'll just briefly remind you what's going to happen and why Jesus is doing this, okay? He's bringing the prophetic fulfillment of everything that happened in the Old Testament, yeah? So he's, he's fulfilling what was lost in Genesis 1, verse 26. Adam and Eve, the man and his bride, they were to rule on earth and create paradise on earth. They failed, Jesus is going to fulfill that. By Genesis 10, man sets up his system of Babylon to control the earth, it just destroys the earth and he's still destroying the earth. So Jesus is going to bring a true kingdom, not the kingdom of Babylon, because that's the first time kingdom is really mentioned in Nimrod's Babylon. Jesus is going to bring in the real kingdom. Genesis 12, God starts it by saying he's going to bring in this kingdom of blessing all the nations through the Abrahamic covenant. And so God enacts that. By Exodus 19, you've got the nation of Israel being called a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. This nation that's going to bring in God's kingdom, they failed, but not permanently. By the time of 1 Chronicles 29.10, you've got God saying, the, uh, giving the, the Davidic covenant that David will always have one of his ancestors seated on his throne in Jerusalem. So that's got to be fulfilled, or God's breaking his covenant. That's going to be fulfilled when Jesus leaves his father's throne in heaven and rules on earth in the kingdom on David's throne. Uh, by the time of Solomon, Solomon's kingdom is actually called the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven is not something that Jesus made up in the Gospels. It's fulfilling the historic narrative of prophetic fulfillment. God's always been bringing in the kingdom. That's what he planned in Genesis. But God's having to bring it to restoration because of sin and wickedness and the satanic trinity and man's rebellion, all these things. And then in Daniel 2, verse 44, we've already read that. Um, but all the prophets, not just Daniel, were talking about this kingdom that's going to come. Yeah? And so by the time you get to the New Testament, um, we get greater information about this kingdom. And so in the New Testament, Jesus starts talking about what this kingdom is. Um, if, let's just look at these uh, fairly quickly and move through. So at the time Jesus was born, the, the angel Gabriel said to Mary, your son Jesus will sit on David's throne, ruling Israel from Jerusalem. Now you'll notice something. None of these things have happened yet. What Christians do is they slip into spiritual language and they use the word kingdom to cover lots of Christian activities. Now, is that good? Well, often I don't think it really matters. The problem is the word kingdom in the New Testament alone, not including the Old Testament, the New Testament alone is the Greek word uh, basileia, basilia. Um, and it's mentioned over 150 times in the New Testament. So if you imagine trying to quantify all the definitions of what kingdom is by looking at all 150 times the word is mentioned, it's, it's quite a task trying to reach a, an overall definition by using 150 different descriptions of it. And so what Christians do is they just take the odd uh, reference to it and apply it to whatever they want. And so kingdom sort of becomes whatever anyone wants it to be. So you'll, you'll hear people say, uh, I'm a kingdom person, I'm a kingdom builder, I'm bringing in the kingdom, I'm expanding the kingdom, I'm into kingdom stuff, I'm kingdom minded, I'm growing the kingdom. Now I'll be honest, I've no idea what a lot of this means. As I've told you before, you know, I've, heard pe I've had people say to me, I, I, I don't come to church, I'm a kingdom person. And, and, and as I've said before, what, what on earth does that mean? I'm not going to serve in the church. I'm, I'm doing kingdom stuff. That's nonsense. What are you talking about? The kingdom is fully realized when Jesus returns with his bride. You're saying you're not his bride. Then you're not getting in the kingdom then. Whatever you think you're doing. 
the, this is the, the Bible's emphasis on kingdom. But because we, we, we misdefine biblical terms, we do this with a lot of stuff. We do it with the word worship. How many people say, I've been listening to some worship? You can't listen to worship. You either do it or you don't. You can't listen to it. Worship's a sacrifice you give. Yeah, we do it with grace. We do it with repentance. I've repented, said in an arrogant tone. Like, well, that's not repentance. I've said I'm sorry. Why don't you forgive me? It's like, all right. A lot of humility in that repentance, isn't there? Repentance is not saying you're sorry. Repentance is changing. Yeah, but we change all these words, and we do it with the word kingdom. And so when we want to do something, we tag the word kingdom on it, and it makes us sound spiritual. But Jesus didn't do that. When Jesus is talking about kingdom, he's being very specific. There's going to be a David's throne. He's going to rule from Jerusalem. Okay, let's go to the next one. Jesus says, repent, the kingdom of heaven is near. He didn't say it's come yet. It doesn't fully come until Jesus returns. Now, some people will think, well, Jesus says, you know, that the kingdom is among us. Yeah, because he was there. Right? You can't have a kingdom without a king. Right? Well, you can have church because the Holy Spirit's here. And, and people mix up the dispensation. We're not in the age of the kingdom. We're in the age of the Holy Spirit in the church. Do you know the difference? Because... We have authority by the Holy Spirit. We have access to power by the Holy Spirit. Miracles and gifts have not been withdrawn. They're here in the church by the Holy Spirit. But we're not in the kingdom till Jesus comes back in its fullest sense. And so if you take this understanding and apply it properly through the biblical use of the word kingdom you will arrive at this conclusion look at the next one jesus in the uh, sermon on the mount blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom yeah but in the kingdom there isn't going to be anybody poor blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness for theirs is the kingdom but in the kingdom there isn't going to be anybody persecuted so Jesus is saying, because you're suffering this now, you will be in the kingdom. But you can't have both at the same time. You can't be poor and persecuted and the kingdom be established on earth. Because when Jesus establishes the kingdom on earth, there will be no persecution and there will be no poverty. Is this making sense? So when people say, well, I'm in the kingdom now, but I'm persecuted and I'm poor and I've got all the... Hold on a minute. Which kingdom are we in? Look at the next one. Jesus taught us to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory. Jesus told us to always be preparing and praying for this kingdom to come. Well, it's here in a spiritual sense. Well, okay, but what does that really mean? Is Jesus here in a spiritual sense? Well, if you want to use that definition, but he's actually on his Father's throne in heaven. The Holy Spirit's here, and he's the exact representation of Jesus. So can you see, I, I, I'm a bit reticent to, to criticize people who use the word kingdom, because often they mean good things. But the kingdom that Jesus is actually talking about that the Bible is actually talking about, the millennial kingdom, it hasn't come. It's still coming. Look at the next one. It gives all the parables. Now, we looked at those, the, the kingdom parables, but you'll notice the parables always have a definite end of something. The, fish, the, you know, the, the dragnet where the fish are sorted, the seeds where it's bundled and the weeds are thrown into the fire and the good seed and the bad seed. There's always a culmination, a, a climax leading to it. We're not at that yet. Jesus hasn't come yet. Now, you'll see why this is important, hopefully, in a moment. Because if we are in the kingdom now, we've got some very serious questions to answer. And it will change your entire behavior. It will change how you live as a Christian. Look at the next one, Matthew 22 and verse 2. The kingdom of heaven is like the wedding banquet that a man prepared for his son. Well, have we had the wedding? Have you been to the marriage supper of the Lamb? Has anyone been? 
What was it like? Well, you haven't been yet. But the kingdom is like that. So the kingdom is when Jesus returns with his bride, right? The, the, the bride, the wedding bag. So the kingdom can't have been fulfilled yet, can it? It can't have fully come yet, can it? Not if you, if you follow Jesus' logic. Look at the next one. When he took communion, he says, I tell you the truth, I will not drink from this cup again until I drink it anew with you in the kingdom. Now, has anyone physically sat down with Jesus and had a drink with him? Any, have any of you? No. Now, we take bread and wine every week, and by, by the Spirit, Jesus is present. He's the other comforter who's the representation of Jesus who's with us now in the church so we have access to the powers of the kingdom to come but the kingdom hasn't come yet, has it? No? Because when it does, we'll be eating and drinking physically with Jesus. We'll see him, right? So let's look at the next one. It's an interesting one, Luke 19, verse 11, because Jesus said to them, people who were thinking the kingdom was going to appear all at once, and he explained to them it wasn't. He said it doesn't come about by careful observation. He's making it very clear to people, look, don't confuse what I'm doing now with the fulfillment of the kingdom that is yet to come. They're not the same thing. When the kingdom fully comes, it's going to be totally different than it is now. Next one, when, when Jesus rode into Jerusalem, they were singing Hosanna to the coming kingdom of David. They thought Jesus was bringing the kingdom in at that moment. But he wasn't. He was atoning for sins. He came as the sacrifice. He's bringing in the kingdom when he does come as king. He is not the king of Israel on David's throne yet, but he will be. And that's why all the prophecies are being fulfilled in Israel to get everything ready for when this happens. That's what's going to happen. So he's not coming about by careful observation, which is the next one. It's not coming all at once, as it says there in Luke 19. It's going, there's going to be a delay before the kingdom comes in. Yeah? Look at the next one. Luke 22 and verse 30. What he said to his disciples, he says, I tell you the truth in the kingdom, you will be sat on 12 thrones judging the tribes of Israel. Well, did any of the disciples do that? No, they were all martyred. Not one of them sat on a throne. And not one of them judged the 12 tribes of Israel in the land of Israel over God's inheritance. So was Jesus telling the truth? Yes, of course he was. So in other words, that can't have happened yet, can it? Can't have. Don't confuse the thrones in heaven with the thrones on earth. They're different thrones. They're linked, but they're not exactly the same. What about the next one? The thief on the cross. What did the thief on the cross say to Jesus? Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. But what did Jesus say? Today you will be with me in the kingdom? No. Today you will be with me in paradise why did jesus change the location of where the thief wanted to be because the thief thought jesus was bringing in the kingdom that day and he wasn't jesus knew that so that's why he says today you'll be with me in paradise paradiso is the word for garden you will be with me in the paradise of heaven you remember paul was caught up into paradise the heavenly realm but the kingdom hadn't come yet so jesus couldn't say today you'll be with me in the kingdom because the kingdom's going to be at least another two thousand years away so the kingdom hadn't fully come yet yeah next one let's turn to this one because i think this is a, a very interesting one john 18 verse 36 uh, when i we did mention this briefly when we looked at kingdom before so i'll not uh Look at it in a huge way. John 18, verse 36. So when he's on trial before Pilate, you remember they've accused him of being the king of the Jews, a rival to Caesar. They've accused him of setting up a kingdom. That's, that's actually the judicial process they wanted him executed on, that he was a rival to Caesar. He's claiming to set, be a king, setting up his own kingdom. 
What did Jesus say? My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. So in other words, Jesus is saying it's not here and it's not now. But it is coming and it's coming from another place. What's he saying? I'm not setting up a kingdom now, but I am setting up a kingdom from heaven on earth. But that's coming later when the servants will fight. That's when he'll call the legions of angels, which he didn't call down then. So you are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answers, you say that I am a king. Yes, he is a king. He is the king. He's the king of kings. But he hasn't set up the kingdom yet. But he's going to. Okay, now I've just used a few there. Now, many of the times Jesus talks about the kingdom or the New Testament talks about the kingdom, um, they, they don't give details as to when and where, they just give descriptions about aspects of it. And that's why sometimes Christians link onto certain aspects of it and say, we have this now. But we don't have the fullness of the kingdom yet. We can't have until Jesus comes back. And if we do have the fullness of the kingdom now, there's no point Jesus coming back. Because we can do it. If we've got it now, he doesn't need to come back. And we are not setting up the kingdom for Jesus to come back because we are not creating his kingdom for him. He's going to do it, just like he's building his church now. So that's why in Acts 1 and verse 6, when the disciples said to Jesus, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom? Jesus says, it's not for you to know the times and the seasons that the Father has set by his own authority. They knew, they thought, well, when are you going to set up the kingdom? Jesus says, well, I'm going to do it when I do it. Your job is to preach the gospel. Yeah? What's our job? To preach the gospel. Isn't it to set up the kingdom? No. What's the difference? There's a big difference. We're going to look at that now. Because if you think your job is to set up the kingdom, you've got a big job on your plate. Because you've got to bring in all the things that Jesus said he was bringing in. So you're going to get rid of all the pollution on the planet, are you? You're going to reform all the governments of the world, are you? You're going to bring in universal and global prosperity for everyone, are you? You're going to do all that. Well, if all the church works together, we'll bring that in. No, we won't. All of us working together, I can't even bring prosperity and joy in the church, never mind the kingdom. <laughs> I can't stop everyone in the church getting on with, you know, I wish all the people in the church would get on with each other. I can't even arrange that. What chance have I got to bring in the kingdom in? Jesus, but Jesus said he'd come in to bring in the kingdom. Yes, they, but they rejected him as king. And so the kingdom is postponed until he comes back. So Israel is now in blindness until Jesus returns. When Israel comes to fullness of faith, then Jesus can return and set up the kingdom and fulfill everything. But until that happens, the kingdom has been postponed. But what Jesus has done in the gap is he's building the church. The church is not the kingdom. And he's building his church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it because the church is his bride and his bride is going to rule with him in the kingdom. But his bride is not the kingdom. My wife is not my house. My wife is not my ministry. My wife is not my job. My wife is my bride. She will rule with me in the house, in my ministry, in my job, in the family. But all those things are not a substitute for her. What God has done is something so marvelous, it's mind-blowing. He's not just going to implement and inaugurate the kingdom. He's going to build a bride before he does that. And she's going to rule with him. And that's us. It's even better than the kingdom coming straight away. That's how God works out his plans. So that's what he's doing in the New Testament. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So why do so many Christians think we're already in the kingdom? Because that's what most Christian denominations teach. Did you know that? 
most Christian organizations and denominations say we are in the kingdom now. We're already in the kingdom. The church is the kingdom. Well, the problem with that is, if you work out that premise to its logical conclusion, you will end up with a certain list of conclusions that will not be what God wants it to be. First of all, if the kingdom is now, then the church needs to be in government now and needs to run everything now. Now, a lot of Christian denominations, that's what they do. Basically, the church becomes the government. And a church then has its own kingdom, and it has someone sat on a throne with a crown, holding a scepter in their hand, dressed like a king, acting as though they're the head of the church. That is the logical conclusion of believing we're in the kingdom now. Now, you can think of denominations that are already doing that right now. They have one supreme ruler who might or might not be infallible, who decides that they are the head of that kingdom. Can you think of one? You end up with, I mean, who's the head of the biggest church in England? Who's the head of the Anglican church? No, he's not. The queen. Well, I thought Christ was the head of the church. That's what the Bible says. The Bible says Christ is the head of the church. No, 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 no. If we're in the kingdom now, the church has to have a head now who rules from a throne now. So you end up with this logic. And so the church is the government. And that's what we had through the whole medieval process. That's what we had from the time of Constantine onwards. That's what we had through the Holy Roman Empire, where if we're in the kingdom now, and we've established the kingdom, and the church has built the kingdom, and the kingdom of heaven is on earth now, then the church needs to run everything now. That's the logic you'll end up with. The church needs to be in government. The church needs to make the rules. The church needs to kill people. The church needs to decide what is and isn't going to happen. The church can throw people into hell. Because we're in the kingdom. And that's what happens in the kingdom. And so when you understand that the medieval church believed that the kingdom had already come, then you understand why they did some of the horrendous things that they did. But it's not just... That, what are some of the other things if we're in the kingdom now? What's the logic of what's going to happen? Well, all the prophecies of the future are irrelevant. Because the prophecies all lead to the culmination of the kingdom coming in. So if we're already in the kingdom, we don't actually need any more prophecies. We just need to pull our finger out and get on with what God's already told us to do. There doesn't need to be any fulfillment. Jesus doesn't need it, even need to come back. We can do it. We've got the Holy Spirit, so get on with it. Bring in the kingdom. Come on, what are you playing at? We're not in the kingdom. So the prophecies of the future are still all going to be worked out. That's the essence of preterism. Then you end up with amillennialism or postmillennialism and where people just bypass the kingdom. One of the statements of faith of our church is that you believe in the premillennial second advent of Jesus Christ. There's a very good reason why those words are used. Because if you take out that word premillennial, you can say we're in the kingdom now. And we're not. We're in the church age now with the power of the Holy Spirit operating through us. I'm not negating the power we have now. But I'm certainly not cancelling out Jesus' glorious return because I think we've already got it, which is what some people do. Next thing, if we're in the kingdom now, Israel's been replaced. God, God, God doesn't need to fulfill his promises to Israel. We're in the kingdom. So if the kingdom is the fulfillment of all God's promises to Israel, if we're in the kingdom now, it doesn't matter about Israel. Now, many Christians still believe this, even though God is now fulfilling all the promises for Israel. I mean, it's ridiculous at the rate the prophecies are being fulfilled at the moment. But some people think it's just all one big accident or coincidence. Christians. Some Christians want to get rid of Israel. Israel. As though God's promises are not going to be fulfilled. Doesn't make any, any sense. 
It makes God out to be a liar. It makes Israel irrelevant. It, it replaces Israel with the church. And it can lead to anti-Semitic views. All based on what you believe about the kingdom. Now, I'm not saying everyone who misuses the word kingdom believes all this, but ultimately take it to its ultimate conclusion and you will get all of these realized. Look at the next thing. If we're in the kingdom now, then we should have the prosperity of the kingdom now. So it justifies extremes of the prosperity movement because they will subtly bring in the conditions of the kingdom and make you feel you should be achieving all that now. And so the abuse of extreme prosperity becomes logical. Well, we're in the kingdom. You shouldn't be poor in the kingdom. You shouldn't even die in the kingdom. You should never be sick. Nothing should ever go wrong with you. Where's your faith? Can you see that your belief about what the kingdom is will affect how you interpret these doctrines? You'll end up feeling guilty because something's gone wrong. And woe betide you if you're sick, because that means you don't have enough faith. And if someone dies, well, dear me, they've kind of been saved. You, it's, it's what's called over-realizing the eschatology. You pull everything that Jesus is going to bring, and you pull it into your reality and make it yours to control. And it isn't. It's God's kingdom. It's the kingdom of heaven. It's what Jesus is going to fulfill. And so when you bring that ultimate aspect of the extreme prosperity built on, you should be sat on a throne now. And I think that's why some of the extreme pr prosperity preachers are sat on thrones. And I'm not now talking about the orthodox type churches. You find it in some of the, the extreme charismatics, you know, the, where, where people are so ostentatious, so focusing on the prosperity that they think it's a sign of their success when it might just be a sign of their self-indulgence and an abuse of what the kingdom actually is. So you lead to charismatic extremism. Because if you're in the kingdom, no one should die. Yeah? You certainly shouldn't be sick, so you, you try and make stuff happen. Because we're in the kingdom, so this shouldn't happen. Yeah, but we're not in the kingdom. That's when Jesus returns. We're in the church with the power of the Holy Spirit. Access to the powers of the age to come, but not fully realized in its ultimate sense. Does anyone here have a resurrected body? And, and no one? If anyone has, can you just walk through that wall and back just to prove it to us? Right? You, we're still subject to the elements of this world. We're still getting old. Yeah? So... If you die, it doesn't necessarily mean something's gone wrong, does it? But it does if you believe we're in the kingdom now. Another thing it leads to, if we're in the kingdom now, is you forget preaching the true gospel and you just focus on what's called a social gospel. Because if we're in the kingdom, the, the knowledge of the glory of the Lord fulfills the whole earth. So our job is just to do nice stuff for people, not preach the gospel. And so you end up with the logic of just trying to fulfill a social gospel, just becoming a community outreach program, just becoming an arm of government, of social welfare or, or helping. Now, all these things are good, and I'm not suggesting that people don't do these things. I think we should do many of these things. That's not the point. Our primary role is to preach the gospel. You see, when Jesus and John the Baptist came and said, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, you'll notice after Jesus ascended to heaven, the preaching changed. The apostles didn't go throughout the, the Roman Empire saying, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. They said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Now, it isn't because they didn't think the kingdom wasn't coming. They know the kingdom still is coming. And Paul makes that clear when he writes to Timothy. But our role is to get people to believe in Jesus, not to try to get people to set up the kingdom. We want people to be saved, not to be brilliant social workers. 
Now, people can be brilliant social workers once they're saved, but let's get it in the right order. We want people to have social interaction, but only through believing, not through thinking, they're coming to bring in the kingdom. And another aspect, then we'll move on and wrap this up tonight, it leads towards humanistic unity and what you could call ecumenism. Whereas if we're in the kingdom, we should all be getting along. So let's just agree to all get along, even though we don't even believe the truth. Because we're in the kingdom. So all churches should agree with each other, yeah? They don't believe in the virgin birth. They don't believe in the resurrection. But let's just get along with them because we're all brothers in Christ. Because we're in the kingdom. We're not in the kingdom. Our job is to remain true as the bride of Christ and be faithful to the bridegroom, Jesus Christ. Our role is to keep truth. Not get rid of truth for the sake of unity. That's going to happen in the kingdom. The unity is going to be brought in. And so, finally then, let's just look at the last aspect to help us understand um, this system. So, I've listed things here in two ways just to help us understand the difference between the, the age we are in, which is the church age, the age of the Holy Spirit, and the kingdom millennium age, which is yet to come. Okay, first thing to understand, and these are dead obvious, Jesus isn't here. The Holy Spirit's here. Yeah? Jesus says, when I go, I will send him to you. He can't come till I go. So that means Jesus can't come back till he takes us back to him. Yeah? So I know we use the word Jesus is here and Jesus lives in our heart and he's the king of our hearts. And it's fine to use all that language. We're not arguing about words. But we're in the church age. Jesus hasn't come back. The Holy Spirit is here. Next one. Jesus, in the church age, is the high priest in heaven interceding for us. Yeah? In the kingdom age, as we've just read, in 19, he's the king of kings who comes back to rule on earth. He's not the king of the world at the moment, but he's going to be. Remember, he fulfills those two roles. He's the high priest and he's the king. But at the moment, he's the high priest interceding on behalf of the church. When he returns, he's going to fulfill his role as king of kings. Next difference between the age we are in and the kingdom age, the millennium to come. Satan's loosed. Have you noticed that? Yeah, if we're in the kingdom, who let the door open? <laughs> Which handcuffs did they use to bind Satan if we're in the kingdom? Because he's running rampant. You know, he's, he's, he's more evil now and doing more destructive things than he's ever done. In the kingdom, he's bound. Yeah? Next one. In the church age... Uh, Christ rules through grace. It brings us to repentance through grace. In the kingdom age, he rules the earth with a rod of iron. And an iron, he, he, he absolutely implements righteousness. There's no, there's no dissent, not during the kingdom age, right? What Jesus says is what Jesus says, and that's what goes, right? He rules as a proper king. Next one. In the church age, Israel is blind, Israel cannot see who their saviour is. The church can. We know who our saviour is. In the kingdom age, Israel believes. The blindness, the veil is removed. And Israel calls on the name of the Lord. Blessed is Jesus, what did Jesus say? You won't see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Quoting Psalm 118, the Messianic Psalm. In other words, Jesus says, you're going to see me again when I bring the kingdom in. And then you're going to call on me and be saved. Israel's one of the key signs that we're coming up to the kingdom age because Israel's blindness is already starting to be removed. Okay, next one. In the church age, the earth is still cursed. Yeah? Have you noticed pollution is not going away? Have you noticed that? Right? But we're in the church. We're, you know, the Holy Spirit's here. It doesn't matter. The earth's still polluted. Right? When you're in the kingdom, creation is going to be blessed. Right? Big difference. You can't sort out earth's problems till Jesus comes back. Next one. The obvious one. 
in the church age, at the end of the church age, the church is taken to heaven. In the kingdom age, the church is brought back to earth. Yeah, Jesus is in heaven, but in the kingdom age, he comes back to earth. So I've just given you a few illustrations there about hopefully we understand the difference between what this thing, the millennial kingdom, is. Now, I just want to make this very clear to everybody. I'm not talking about words. I sometimes use the word kingdom to describe stuff that might not fit in with that. I might use words in a way. I'm not talking about someone using the wrong word. And people do use the word kingdom for all kinds of good things. I'm not saying you mustn't use the word. I'm saying understanding what it fully means in its truest sense. It's when Jesus returns to earth to set up his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. That's ultimately what Jesus meant by that. And at the moment, he's building his church by the Holy Spirit. We have power and access, but the kingdom doesn't come until Jesus returns. As long as we understand that, we won't be deceived into doing something we think is kingdom stuff when actually it's not. Amen.